I get to school and everyone's laughing, everyone's snickering. The front page of the newspaper posted all over the school. The headline said, fat and fit. Caused me to go into a deep state of anorexia. You realize pretty quickly that all the personal development books, courses, all of these other things, they're building on a foundation that isn't solid. Before we jump into this episode, I'd love to invite you to be a part of the community where you can listen to more content to help you be a smarter, stronger, and better equipped successful leader. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button. I would love and appreciate your support. It's amazing to me to watch the community grow and read all of your comments each and every week. I can't wait to go on the journey with you. Thank you so much, and it means the world to me. Welcome to the Impact Driven Leader Podcast with your host, me, Tyler Deckerhoff. On today's episode, we are going to focus on unlocking excellence with my friend, Justin Rothling Schofer. Man, my name is difficult. I appreciate that you just take it up another level, Justin. Uh, I'm excited for you to be here, but let me share a little bit for you listeners, watchers, viewers about Justin. Over the last 20 years, Justin has worked with Stanley Cup champions, NHL MVPs, Super Bowl champions, Olympians, seven, eight, nine, 10 figure entrepreneurs, Fortune 500 companies, all the things. He's a sports and performance human biologist um, educated individual who has a real passion in hockey, but as I've learned, he more importantly has just a passion for people to bring out the absolute best in people. And a lot of that he does through his organization, Own It, where he speaks. He is the author of five books. His next book is releasing the end of April. Justin, thanks so much for joining me. I'm excited to have the flip side of this. As I was uh, a guest on your show, this conversation is going to be far better because you are the guest. <laughs> I, I I doubt that, but um, oh. Tyler, it's a it's a pleasure it's a pleasure to be here. And um, number one, you got my last name absolutely dialed, so I uh, I think that's outstanding. Um, yeah, but number two, I, I, I know what that's reading, like. Yeah, I know. I know. I, and there's a lot of people that just don't even take a stab at it. They're just like, Justin R. And I'm like, come on, you got to at least go for it. Like, uh, it just at least put an effort in. Yeah. But then yeah. secondarily, even as you were reading my intro, it's, uh, I want people to know that there's nothing extraordinary about any of those things. It's rather just that I've chosen um, to be extremely consistent and also just showing my age at how old I am. But if you're consistent with anything, the results are going to come. You've probably just quit a little bit too early, and we're probably going to touch on a little, bit, a little bit of this throughout the show. You share in your book, Own It. You share in your life, your you know what you speak to, and, and on your podcast, you know some of the the challenges you faced early in life. For the audience here, that's just learning who you are, Justin R. Uh, can you share kind of some of the personal challenges that you struggled with, dealt with early in your life? So, as a young boy, I mean, growing up in Canada. Um, wanting to play in the National Hockey League. And that was that was really everything that I ever wanted to be. And I still remember um, I went into, I, I grew up, grew up a, a, a fat kid, if you will, and uh, just happened to be blessed with an extreme talent when it came to hockey. And my parents, uh, again, God bless them. They were, they're, they're amazing people that just, had an incredibly loving home, supported me in every way that they possibly could, um, just saw a lot of my self-worth, a lot of my self-esteem, just being low. And I, I felt uncomfortable with, with who I was and in my body. And we went to a study at the University of Alberta, um, really looking at kids who um, were a little bit overweight and what were the habits and behaviors that they were engaging in regularly and what were some fitness levels of all of these things. And I still remember going in there and during my fitness test, I walked into the lab and there was the goaltender for the Edmonton Oilers doing the test right before me, just because they shared the lab at the U, that's where they did everything. And I remember walking in just being like, oh my gosh, like there he is. Like that's one of my just people I look up to. That's like who I want to be. And I see him doing the test and it's the same test that I'm going to be doing. And it was like, man, like, this is really cool. Like, this is awesome. And I still remember I get up on the bike, I get all locked in, I get, get every, like, I get the tube in my mouth, I get the headset on, I get geared up onto the bike, we're doing a VO2 max test. And he comes up to me, and his name's Ty Conklin. And he comes up to me and he goes, you're going to kill it. 
you're going to do way better than I am. And it brings tears to my eyes because I just, it, it, it spoke to me. It was like, oh, it, it's like if you, have an, if you have somebody that you look up to so heavily that all of a sudden doesn't know you but comes up yeah. to you and just says like, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. And I got on, finished the bike test. It was great. Um, got all the test results back and was in the 99.9th percentile because of, of overweight kids, right? So every other overweight mm-hmm. kid was eating junk food, wasn't, was watching TV, was playing video games, was doing nothing physically active, but I was the exact opposite. And yet my fitness test came back again, it was like a 47 VO2 max as a 12 year old kid, which is which is very high, um, which is positive, but I was just fat. I was just overweight. Portion sizes were probably too big. Um, uh, quality of food sometimes could have been better, but you're a kid, like, you know what I mean? But it was just yeah. genetically set up that way. And the, this article came out. I didn't realize the article came out in the front page of the Edmonton paper. And remember, I'm coming off of this going, man, I'm in the 99.9th percentile. I'm feeling good about myself. I just seen my idol. He had just talked to me, like all of these things, really, really good. And I get to school and everyone's laughing, everyone's snickering. And as I walk in, there's the front page of the newspaper posted all over the school. And it's a picture of me on the bike. Remember that bike moment for me was like powerful for my self-esteem and like where I was going. That picture posted and the category above or the, the, the headline said fat and fit. And I walked in and I just started to cry. I started to cry, started to weep. And that was this deep seated like cut for me that... Uh, really just started to change like my thought process. And uh, as I continued through my, uh, that was 11 years old at 12, um, I'm playing with 15, 16 year olds. Um, and my dad said to me, son, talent will get you noticed, but consistency will get you paid. And I was like, I need to become the most consistent version of me. But as I tried to become the most consistent version of myself, I also had a deep fear of being fat. And so a lot of these habits and behaviors, I started to measure um, my um, heart rate variability at night. I, I measured heart rate during every activity I was doing while I was sleeping, pulse oximetry, brainwave monitoring. I started to read medical journals where everybody else was reading comic books. It was really powerful to start learning all of this deep scientific data and start to understand this vessel I was living in. But the fear that was crippling me and the pain that was still there um, caused me to go into a deep state of anorexia and uh, went from 142 pounds to 98 pounds uh, as a 14, 15, 16-year-old. Um, was Had crazy um, exercise routines, um, had OCD to the level of where I would run between classes. I'd have to do 10 squats, 10 push-ups before I could pick up my books and go to class. I uh, would run up and down the stairs five times before I'd sit down for dinner. After I ate, I'd have to do sit-ups and push-ups. Uh, I slept without blankets so it was colder. Um, I take cold showers, um, all of these things that quite frankly, if you were just doing them because that was like a habit that you had, they're not typically bad, but what, what made them negative was where they stemmed from. And so I say all of that to say that was, I think, one of the first things in my life that really created this sense of fear in me, this sense of uh, trauma when it came to my health that... I'm grateful for today because it really set me on the trajectory to now do what it is that we're doing as a company. Um, the the way that we're influencing some of the highest performers in the world, and um, really what our team and our company at Own It really stands for is giving people agency, control, and a sense of empowerment over their health for what is honestly the first time knowing that health is not unidimensional, but multidimensional yeah. and holistic in nature, mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional. Yeah, which, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with those <laughs> four elements. But you talk about being at school and weeping and kids laughing. How did that affect your personal life, your relationships, either in your family, including your teammates, all those things? I mean, there's a little bit of it as you – Write that down. And honestly, I had some of those infatuations 
journals. Mine was more on cows and, and wanting to be a veterinarian. Yours is more, okay, great. It's all the same, right? Tip for tap. But I look at this and like, how did that affect all your relationships? And how did that affect you personally? To be honest, I think at the onset, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it. Um, but knowing that I've always felt different. I've always felt like I didn't fit in. I've always felt like I was the odd duck. I always felt like I was on an island. And I think as I further went down this road of what I knew was right. And here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little caveat in here. Yeah. Because I, th- I, I say that I was anorexic, but I would never say that I was sick. And here's yeah. the reason why. Is I knew what I was doing was hurting me, but I didn't know how to live differently than what I was in a healthy way. I wasn't educated enough. I didn't know how to put the way I was feeling into a newer context. I knew the way that I was, uh, that some of my behaviors and habits that were instilled by my family were not ones that I should be engaging in long-term for a high performance lifestyle, uh, if you will. But I didn't know what those looked like. I didn't know how to put those into play. I didn't know how to make them mine. I didn't know how to have agency and control over them. And so I knew deep down the truth of what was here, but there was trauma that didn't allow me to get there. And that trauma, I think, extenuates into this entire thing that we experience in life because in our world today, we think that we lead with physical health. We need the six pack Mm. abs. We need to be a certain weight. We need to look a certain way. We need to fit clothes in a certain way. We need to um, eat a certain diet. So we take the physical habit. We need to all cold plunge. We need to all sauna. We need to all do some type of red light therapy. Like we're doing all the things physically to look a certain way with the idea that maybe then we'll be accepted. Maybe then we'll be enough. Maybe then we will um, be treated the way that we want to. All that does when we take a bottom-up approach, physical first, it erodes your heart. It poisons your heart. It creates emotional issues. So fear, anxiety, overwhelm. And that fear, anxiety, and overwhelm then deteriorates your mind. The way that you think, your thoughts, your behavior, or your thoughts and your your emotions, which create again this thought of I'm not good enough, this thought of I'm not far enough along, this feeling that I'll never get this right, and then it separates us spiritually from what it is that we're truly called to do, what it is that we were truly called to be a part of, what we were truly called to have impact in this world of, because we're not healthy. We're not well in the mind and in the body. We're not well in any of this category, but that's the way the world has taught us to operate is a bottom-up approach. Choose the physical habit, choose what you're going after, and all of a sudden, everything else starts to separate because when we don't integrate everything, we disintegrate our health and it starts to disintegrate. Now, if we take a top-down approach, and this is where my healing came from, was I figured out, hey, you know what? This is what I'm called for. This is my reason for being here. This is my deep, like my deep desire for what I want to do. And I'm connected and called by what my God-given purpose is. The moment I did that, it ultimately renewed my mind. It renewed the thought process I had. I am good enough. I am worthy enough. I am am exactly where I need to be. I'm not a failure. I'm simply learning of what it is and, and going on this journey by design so that I can get to where I need to go, which thus purified my heart. Take, took everything from fear, anxiety, and overwhelm, turned it into this deep conviction and confidence in the actions that I was taking to then actually know exactly what the priorities were at certain points of time. When it was a a deep priority to actually start training harder, when it was a priority to start training for a marathon, when it was a priority to uh, start cold plunging and um, getting in saunas, when it was a priority to change my morning and night routine, when it was a priority to start focusing on a different uh, environment that I was in. Because you can't do it all at once. But when you can figure out what your priorities are because everything is in alignment, all of a sudden, everything that you've been chasing starts chasing after you. The weight loss, the six-pack abs, the muscles, the more energy, the better sleeps, all the things physically that we've been after that we were like, hey, just take a physical approach. 
when you actually start at the top and you get spiritually aligned, which renews your mind, which thus um, creates the healing of the heart and then the physical priority list, that's when everything gets healed. That's when everything starts to work. That's when everything gets into alignment and that's when it becomes sustainable. So when did that happen? Because we started this 12, you shared 11, 12. And I think this is very relatable. I, as you're telling me something I've experienced, but when was it? Was that 13? Was that 18? Was that 27? Was that 31? Yeah, like I said, my journey of, and remember, we went back to this level of identity as saying, hey, you're an anorexic kid. That was shed probably around 18 with one of my coaches that um, just really started to educate me in my disciplines, because that's what I thought I was doing. I thought I was executing just deep level of discipline um, and thought I was earning something and didn't really realize how badly I was hurting myself um, to the point of liver and kidney failure. It didn't heal everything. It didn't heal the deep inner need for approval. It didn't heal the inner need for um, where I was trying to go. And those addictions, led, or that those, I guess those addictions, those habits led from addiction to exercise, addiction and obsession over um, what I was doing daily led to addiction at work, led to addiction of education, led to addiction of, uh, of a performance heart of continually striving and pushing myself um, in every way, shape, or form. And some people might be going, yeah, that's really good ambition. But the ambition where I was trying to go was not out of a place that was in alignment with what it was that I was called to. Yes, did the outcome help me get to where I needed to go? That's why I'm grateful for it. Got my uh, two undergraduate degrees. I got a hockey scholarship down to the States. I then uh, had a cup of coffee as a pro, was able to then go get a, my master's degree, then went on to work on my PhD, then all of a sudden was the youngest performance director in the NHL and, and impacting people at a high, high degree, but I was so unhappy. And I realized that a lot of the way I was living, having that lifestyle of what the NHL was, not managing stress well, consistently having to perform, not having any deep relationships because it was all based on transaction, not being able to be at home and have um, time that was intentional with my my spouse led to a divorce, um, not being able to uh, give back to myself, although physically I look great, you've got the six pack abs, you've got the muscle, but I didn't have, uh, I had brain fog, I wasn't sleeping well, I had low levels of energy, and at 29, I went to the doctor and I was like, you know what? Like something is not right. Like I literally can't eat. I don't feel well. And they did a colonoscopy and an endoscopy and they found an ulcer the size of a quarter in my stomach and seven polyps the size of my thumb and my colon, all precancerous that he said, if you wouldn't have come in, you wouldn't have seen your 35th birthday. And so it came to this point where I realized that like, I literally had to start living differently. And so to answer your question, it, it, was, it was at 29, 30 years old that I finally realized what this alignment had to be. I was able to surrender to this component of, I can't control where I'm trying to go. I have to just ultimately lean into what God's called me to do and be obedient to the next steps of which have been placed in front of me while prioritizing my habits and what it is that's there. I mean, I come back to how I live my life and I come back to Romans 12, 1, which is, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And I, I oftentimes, for me, forget the first three quarters of that verse and I just lean on these last seven words, which is, this is your true and proper worship. And the reason I say that is because it's not about getting into your Bible. It's not about going to church. It's not about doing all the religious things. Yeah. It's just, how are you living? Like, how are you living? Yeah. How do you show up every single day? What habits and behaviors have you developed? What do you do consistently? What do you do intentionally? That's what matters. How are you stewarding this life you've been given? How are you stewarding this able body you've been given? Are you filling it full of crappy food and not exercising and not sleeping and uh, people that drag you down and these habits that aren't building you up? Well, how do you expect then to go and break down the walls of all the aspirations and all the things and all the goals that you have if you're not stewarding the thing that's actually supposed to do it, if you're not managing it well? And so yeah. it, that, that is like this big aha for me is when you get your order right, spirit first, 
mind second, heart third, physical fourth, and really start to align these perfectly in terms of thought process and where our intention comes from, we're then able to realize the results on the other side, knowing that consistency compounds, knowing that when you act intentionally, you're able to lean in, knowing that when you're able to move forward, you can actually see transformation that's sustainable and long lasting. And it's only at that point that you're able to actually see the things that you're wanting. Because at the end of the day, what you're called for is so much bigger than what you're praying for. But what you're praying for you're not yet prepared for. And so you have to change how you're preparing. You have to change how you're living. You have to change how you're thinking. You have to change your habits and your behaviors at your core because your habits and behaviors are simply the predictors of your outcomes. And if you're able to truly create change, you have to go back and look at your foundation. So I want to paint a picture here. You talk about this 2930 and and again, sharing... Putting into com- in, in, encompassing everything that you just said, but let's start with the picture, painting the picture of this being out of order, focusing on either the aesthetic or whatever is seemingly playing the game to be, you know, at the pinnacle of your position or, you know, from a, a career point of view. So just go through, you know, sharing with me and, and sharing with the audience and, and hopefully they can relate to what did your life look like, like right about the point where you're like, I can't do this anymore, where you talk about going and getting those procedures done and finding out the ulcer, the polyp. So like, what was going on in your your spiritual life? What was that active like? What was going on in relationships, your, you know, your physical, all of those things, you paint more of that picture that led you to that point. Yeah. So um, I was working in Anaheim with the Ducks um, in the NHL and going back and forth between San Diego and their American League team and, uh, and the NHL managing health and performance for um, what I call the best athletes in the world. And it was great. It was a lot of people's dream job. You're, you're striving towards a, a championship. You've got something that you're striving for as a team. Uh, you're in an environment with a lot of guys on the same page, pulling the same direction, going, you're in sport, right? You're at the pinnacle yeah. of sport. Yeah. We were on the road about 110 days a year, um, traveling, um, finishing games up even when we're at home not getting like having a home game usually not getting home until 12 30 one o'clock in the morning only be back at the rink at about seven eight o'clock in the morning on the road you're obviously eating restaurant food and drinking and going out with the guys and um you're on a bunch of airplanes and there's a big amount of stress to be able to perform, a big amount of stress to be able to get the results that you're looking for, a big amount of stress pressure. and pressure to be able to win. Yeah. Okay. And the culmination of all of that ultimately came to this point of um, I was I didn't have a, a spiritual practice, meaning I wasn't in the Bible. Um, mm-hmm. I used God more as like a genie. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. When uh, – when I needed something and when I needed something to go well and um, didn't have a consistent prayer life, didn't have a faith-based community that I could abide in. Uh, I didn't have tip of the spear people to, to hold me accountable. Um, I didn't have tip of the spear people to help me grow. And so I was uh, innately, I was, I was, I was, if I'm being honest, probably lonely as well um, okay. in that space as, as a, as a man. And so those are the things that really kind of stand out in yeah, yeah. in that time of my life. As you paint that picture, I'm just, I'm thankful you did because not to want to revisit, but man, that's so relatable. I, I can relate to myself. You know, twenty nine thirty, maybe even extending further. I, I I can't help but think there's people listening that have either been there or are still there, because to me, what you've shared is not it, it's unique to you. But I think it's it, it really is a journey so many people go through uh, because we do have that misaligned what's important. So what did what advice would you give someone that's going through that? You know, the the younger Justin or or to the younger Tyler, would you say, hey, when you're facing these challenges, the the addictions, the mental health challenges, the the personal relationship issues, what advice would you give them just as a as an olive branch, a start, a hey. Too often we lean on our own understanding. We lean on the experts. We lean on the influencer. We lean on the other people. And we don't lean on 
our faith. We don't lean on, um, we don't lean on God. We don't lean on that. For me, like I said, I've got a, I've got a deep relationship with Jesus. Like that's, that's where I found my saving grace. That's where I find my deep level of conviction. That's where I find my peace. That's where I find, um, my next steps. And without that first foundation, like I talked to you about like the order, yeah. right? Yeah. Spirit first, mental second, emotional third, physical fourth. When that order is out of order, no person, no thing can fix it. It's only that deep relationship. And when that is out of order, when that's missing, you can have a lot of things that feel like they're a great substitute. You can feel like there's a lot of things that um, take their place. Uh, you can have a supplement, you can get a procedure, you can um, read a book, you can have some type of pleasure that eliminates the the feeling that's there. But if you don't actually fill that God-sized, God-sized hole yeah. that's inside of you, you're always going to be chasing that thing. You're always going to yeah. be looking for something else. You're always going to be nagging and nudging towards something because it is a God-sized hole and there's only one thing that can fix it. I say there's so many solutions out there, but they're all overpriced and a cheap substitute for what is actually free. That I think is the the component that we have to all come back to is what is it that you're building your life on? And what is it that you're, uh, where is it that you're going to? I, there was one of my mentors said to me, um, because as usual, people do on their journeys, right? And uh, this is this is not against anybody on what journey you're in. You're not on you're not on my journey. I'm not on your journey. And uh, a lot of people start on this journey in the personal development space. They they lean in. They'll go to a um, a Tony Robbins event, or they'll go to uh, one of these other influencers' events, and they'll be talking about this concept of spirituality and um, something bigger than you and all of these things and they lock onto it. But you realize pretty quickly that all the personal development books, all the personal um, development courses, all of these other things, they're building on a foundation that isn't solid. They're building on a foundation that isn't something that you can actually lean into. And I realized that I was reading more personal development books and hadn't actually ever opened up the Bible. And when I actually started to lean in, in a very purposeful way, that's when everything started to change for me. That's when everything was really able to turn into a relationship that I had a foundation of stone. And I, I mean, I can tell you stories where even this doesn't mean after 30 years old that my life was easy and no difficulties and away we go. But what was different was the peace that I had. What was different was mm. the conviction that I had. What was different was the confidence I had. What was different yeah. was uh, the le- the way in which um, you're able to trust and surrender the outcomes that what is supposed to happen will happen. And you just have to continue to be obedient to where you're going. Is alignment a proper word for that? Yeah. I mean, I think alignment is, but I would say... Yeah. Um, Surrender it's deeper. And it's more encompassing. Yeah, but yeah, it's I would just say kind surrender of- and surrender and patience is, I think, okay. a big one. Surrendering your outcomes okay. and having patience to wait for what it is that you're yeah. truly supposed to experience. And waiting doesn't mean that you do nothing. Waiting means that you take action you in yeah. a obedient way. Um, say it's, it's it's not what I want to do, but it's what I'm supposed to do next. So. That process to me, you know, you talk about your saving grace and the peace and the alignment and and the purpose, right? Tell us about the first time you acted out in that and and you're like how you help someone and really became that guide for them. You know, what were their challenges? How did you help them overcome it? What results happened in their life? Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I think I was living it the whole time and I was just a blind and oblivious to see it. Um, And what I mean by that is... So growing up in the home that I did, it was a very spiritually rich household, full of love, uh, a viciously praying mother. And so I just, I learned to talk to God at a a young age. And um, at 11, I I heard God say, hey, you are going to um, redeem the health of the world. And so in knowing this um, and having this deep conviction and this deep understanding as a young boy, 
I was like trying to figure out how to, how to actually make this something that was tangible. Like how, like how do you lean into this? And so now if you actually think about it, all the struggles I've been through, everything that I had experienced yeah. was preparing me. Cause again, remember when I went to college at 19 years old, came down to the U S when I went to college, getting two undergraduate degrees in exercise science and nutrition to start, then my master's degree, then my postgraduate work, I had already six to seven years of data and tracking and biometric information and looking at blood work and a deep interest and knowledge when I started to get really obsessed with everything that I was doing. So everything that I was learning was like second nature to me. And I just, Mm -hmm. I could just go off the cuff. It was, it was something that just came so easily to me where the rest of my classmates, a lot of my peers, even a lot of my teachers and professors, it didn't make sense to them. They couldn't understand Mm -hmm. how I was putting two and two together. Then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden you get to the NHL and you're working with the best athletes in the world and you're taking them from injury rates of uh, 60 and 70% down to 15 and 20% and having some of the lowest sickness rates, some of the lowest injury rates, having some of the highest, uh, uh, performance and energy stability rates in the league. Like, how does this happen? It's nothing I did. It was simply being able to take the cumulative or culminative effects of everything I'd been through and now putting it into practice of what I had learned. And, at 29 and 30, a big epiphany that I had was, again, just vividly heard this voice say, when are you going to stop serving the audience you want to? Basically meaning, when are you going to put your ego down and start serving the audience that I called you to? And that was the moment that I knew that I needed to step away from the NHL, step away from what I was doing, step away from what I was just pouring my heart and soul into because it was all about the image. It was all about the physical side of things. It was all about what did I look like? What logos were I, was I wearing? How was I, um, how was I traveling? Who was I associated with rather than what I was actually called to do, which was redeem the health of the world and redeem the health of the world through empowering, educating, and equipping with the information and the processes and philosophies necessary to make somebody feel like they have control and agency over their health again and really create an ecosystem that allowed them to step into that. And so there was never a confidence issue with could we take somebody from where they are to where they want to be? Because to be honest with you, at, at, at this point, we've done it thousands of times, but it's what lane and what avenue are you going to do it? Because in the NHL, they show up at your door every single day, Tyler. Yeah. You know this. Yeah. They show up at your yeah. door every single day because the season rolls around just like it does on September 1st every single year, and away you go. You've got 26 yeah. men that you got to make sure that are healthy, that are able, that are able to play and pull out the best performance that you can. But when all of a sudden you go into business for yourself or you step out in service, where do the people come from? Yep. <laughs> who are you? Who are you going to yeah. serve? And yeah. We know the health, wellness, and performance space is a very busy and competitive place, but how do you stand out? And that's where it comes back to, again, something that I knew from a very young age, that I was different. I was unique. I was built different for a purpose. I was built different for a reason. And so a lot of the messaging, a lot of the way that we show up, it's just different. It's not the same as everything else. For me, different is a holy word. It's it's equivalent to that of something holy. It's set apart. It's unique. It stands out, and that is, is that is something that we take really seriously, just in how we show up and how we do life, and and how we and and how we serve people. There's a, a lot of your story that's relatable to me, and I'm, I'm guessing it is to other people. For you, it was, you know, the the extent that you got into human nutrition. For me, it was cow nutrition. I mean, I started at 12, much like you, and that was my career for a long time. It's pivoted, changed, but. There's a lot of similar elements, but one thing that I knew that you related to is I thought it was about that. You, you know, as you shared, thought it was about helping that NHL athlete be there, but yet you were called to something greater. And I I believe that. But one thing that I relate to is the experiences you had actually, in my opinion, drew you closer to the people that I believe you serve now, whether it was the 
obsessive, you know, to a point infatuation early, the anorexia to, you know, something you didn't talk about. You talk about one of your books, suicide to opioid addiction to, you know, divorce to getting fired, all those things that our, our society is dealt with in every way in, in some of the NHL community, but not as large as in whole. And so as you you share those, I'm reminded of my own journey is to help me connect and better relate to people. And that's what I heard from you. So mm-hmm. I want to know, who are you serving now? Tell me about these people and your experiences of, of serving them now in a completely different, like you said, they don't show up on September 1st to say, all right, Justin, what do I do? Yeah, so it's 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 a it's a great point, and I think as you like I said, I, I never want to come on to a to a podcast and just stack right because as you go through that, and even as I reflect back on my on my thirty six years of of life, and you go, oh my gosh, the guy went through severe anorexia, the guy went through depression, the guy's uh, got ADD and dyslexia, the guy was suicidal and has a couple. Hey, some of us um, are bold, okay. <laughs> Deep, deep stories there. There's uh, drug addiction. There's identity crisis at 27, 28, 29, 30 years old. There's um, uh, there's divorce. There's all of these things. I'm like, how much, and I still remember this. I've, I've asked many times, like I'm crying out to God going, like, how much more can I take? Like, how much more do I have to go through? And a lot of it was I was trying to control the outcomes myself. Mm. But secondarily, it was... And, and I believe this, and this is going to get very deep into just the type of relationship that I have with, um, with Jesus, is there's such a large calling on what it is that I'm called to do that the enemy doesn't want that to happen. And so there's going to be a lot of challenge, a lot of adversity, and a lot of things that I have to overcome in order to do that. And it wasn't until I finally surrendered to that and said, whatever I'm called to do, Whatever it is that I'm meant to do, like shape me, mold me, put me through it. I'm ready because I know I'm not doing it alone. And it was at that moment that I was able to actually start taking things on and not feel like I had to carry it, not feel like I had to go through it, not feel like I had to pull the cart, but rather this isn't my business. This is God's business. This is not my life. It's God's life. This is not my message. It's God's message. And all I can do is show up obedient. I can show up well. I can show up focused. I can show up persistent. And I can do it consistently over and over and over and over and over again. And that's what creates the outcomes. And so going back to the people that we serve, we serve people who are looking for how to feel better. We're looking for people who are wanting to say, hey, I know that I don't feel the way that I used to. I know that I'm not feeling as well as I once did. I know that I don't have the energy in which it is that to lean into what it is that I know is I'm called to do. Every single one of us has this vivid vision of what mm-hmm. it is that we're called to do. Every single person, I don't care who you are, you've got this massive vision of what it is that you're called to do. But then you're living at a certain reality. And there's this gap that exists between this. And the only difference between those people that are living accordance to their potential and living living up to what that vision is and experiencing that is that they've built the capacity in order to do so. They've built the habits, the behaviors, and the lifestyle that garners them that opportunity to keep realizing that. And so What we do is we close that gap. We close that gap by helping you build a life by design. We close that gap by helping you to establish the habits, behaviors, and lifestyle that is different than the way that the rest of the world lives. We start, we close that gap by creating N of one solutions, meaning solutions that are different for you, Tyler, that are different for me, Justin, because we don't have the same life. I don't have kids like you do. I, I, I don't have to think about that component to this. Uh, it's different for somebody who's single. It's somebody who's, who's different who works W-2. It's somebody who's different who has one business versus 17 businesses. It's very different across the board. Somebody who travels, somebody who doesn't. But you have to make sure that you're continuing to prepare yourself, continuing to build capacity, continue to be in alignment with this and live a life by design. Because when you increase capacity, you increase what you can ultimately impact. And I said it right at the beginning of the show. I don't know if some people caught this, but what you're called to is bigger than what you're praying for. 
we can come in and say, man, I just, I need to get this job or man, I need to get this house or man, I need to, we think in terms of like something that's, that, that we can see within like an attainable amount of time or something we need in the immediate. That's what we're praying for. But man, what you're called for is so much greater than that. The downside is that what we're even praying for, we haven't prepared ourselves for. And so there's, again, that gap that's there. And we can't just sit and do the same things over and over again because your outcomes are simply the lagging effect of your habits and behaviors. And when you lean in in a purposeful way and identify what you need, what your body needs, and being held accountable, being able to understand how it's adapting to all of these different stressors that you have in your life, that is the moment that everything changes. That is the moment that you have the energy and capacity to lean in, to do the things necessary to get to where you want to go. That's how you're ultimately able to connect at a deeper level and truly not have these anxieties, these overwhelms that you've been dealing with in the past that have just crippled you from being able to take action that's going to move you in the proper direction. And so changing your lifestyle, changing your habits, changing your behaviors in a very purposeful and personal way while understanding what's happening in inside at the cellular level from different forms of testing, DNA, epigenetic, cellular testing, being able to actually apply this, we've been able to integrate, again, the way that we would work with professional athletes, with the team and philosophy of professional athletes, and basically democratize high performance for every person um, in the world. You really talk about the power of ownership. And I we think do that's talk a, about the power a of ownership. Good segue here to the end. You know, I mentioned in the beginning a book, but everything you just shared right there to me and, and the word that just kept reverberating was ownership, taking ownership, taking ownership, taking mm. ownership. And so, you know, as we one final question, one final comment for you, Justin, is talk about that a little bit more and maybe make it, tease it a little bit. I want the audience to go buy your book, right? And learn more about it there. Uh, I do that just as a friend, but it's like, we can't, we don't have enough time to talk about yeah. the book. That's why you wrote the book. But just a little tease of like, what, what really is the driver in that? You know, as we wrap up, you know, where people can find it, but also this, this tang, this morsel of the power of ownership. I say the power of ownership is the intersection point between accountability and responsibility. Uh, we all know what we need to do, but a lot of us don't understand how we need to do it, or we can't be, uh, we, we, we aren't convicted to take that first step. That's the first thing that hinders everybody. They always say, oh, just start with the first step. Great. Well, I, one, I don't know how. And two, I don't understand how to do it. So within the book, The Power of Ownership, we try to take you from a space of knowing. You know what to do. You know what to eat. You know how to sleep. You know how to um, train. You know who to be around. You know how to grow. You know, you know all the answers, but you just haven't yet been convinced how to do them. When I take you into a state of understanding, Understanding your body, understanding your mind, understanding how they parlay and how they interact together, understand how you've been created uniquely, understand how everything is integrated together mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. You have this new level of conviction that you need to live life a certain way, that you now feel empowered because you're equipped with the information that you need through the education we provided and then the ongoing support to make that something that becomes sustainable. And so that's what this book is meant to be. It's meant to be a tool. It's meant to be something that you utilize in a very unique and individualized way. It's going to be different how you implement it to be different how somebody else is going to implement it. There's people that we've given the book to um, that are like, man, I, this is going to be like a tool that I use for like years to come, like th that I keep coming back to, that continues to hold me accountable, that continues to keep me on point. That's the goal. That's the purpose. That's the mission. This is, th this, it literally becomes your blueprint and your playbook that you can keep coming back to. And in the season when you're single is going to look different than the season when you're married is going to look different from the season when you're a mom or a dad is going to look different from the season from when you go from being a W2 to an entrepreneur is going to be different from when you sell your company um, to when you now start a new one. It's all of these things. When life changes, you have to adapt. If you don't adapt, you die. And that is the thing that we start to fall back on. And so the power of ownership is giving you control back. I love, I, I mean, I love the title, um, the, the, like the power of ownership. It just like sings to me, but the subtitle of, uh, redeem your health, live life by design and break the relentless pursuit of normal 
is something that just rings to my soul because the world has told you you have to learn live a certain way. The, t- the world has said you need to do certain things, but we were called to be different. We were called to live differently because we were called to get different results than everybody else gets. But if we only live the way everybody else lives, why would we expect to get something else? And so we have to live differently in order to get something different because we know that any type of success is uncommon. And so yeah. we want to be the uncommon person. Man, I love it. Justin, thank you so much for your time. Um, and to everyone that tuned in, viewed this, whether you're a subscriber on YouTube, if you're not, hit subscribe on YouTube. Um, if you could do me a favor for Justin, uh, for the rest of anyone else that is uh, a guest on this podcast, so their message reach more pe- reaches more people, give us a rating, a review, wherever you listen to podcasts so you can find out about more impactful leaders like Justin. Thank you again so much for being here. Until next time, have a good one.